everybody. Thanks for attending today's webinar. My name is Jason Stegen. I will be your moderator for today's event. Before we begin the program today, I wanted to, to take the opportunity to let our valued Bradmark customers know that there will be no disruption in Bradmark's technical support services due to the coronavirus, and we will continue to maintain a business-as-usual operation. Now, on to the program. Uh, I just wanted to welcome and thank everybody for joining us today. We wanted to acknowledge that wherever you are, we hope that you're safe during these crazy, turbulent times. My name is Jason Stegent from Bradmark Technologies, and I'll be your moderator for today. Quickly, for those not familiar with Bradmark, we are the go-to solution provider for SAP ASE, IQ, and Replication Server and SAP HANA environments. A longtime former Sybase, uh, now SAP partner, we are committed to supporting the database user community by delivering content and solutions that are essential to your critical data infrastructure. So we hope that these sessions coming up, especially this one to get started, will provide real value to those who are maintaining their on-prem investment, moving to the cloud or both. So just a reminder, this is the first of our three SAP Sybase webinars, and the title is Tips, Tricks, and Little-Known Features Within SAP ASC 16. And we're excited to have Rob Vercher, Vice President of SAP Global Database Solutions, as our keynote speaker today, followed by our own Ed Stangler, who's the Director of R&D for Bradmark Technologies. I did want to mention a few housekeeping notes before we get started so everybody can make the best use of their experience. There is no dial-in option for attendees. You're going to be hearing this through your PC speakers or through your mobile device. If the audio is not loud enough for you or if you're in a cubicle-based environment, I would imagine not as many of you are now considering the current business climate, but if you are, we always recommend headphones. In terms of the interface that you're seeing, you can do a number of different things. One of the questions we always get is, hey, I want to have the ability to min-max any of my windows, view the slide deck in full screen mode, for example. You can absolutely do that. Uh, one of the key features, obviously, for today, we asked all of you to send in your questions beforehand, and we had a ton of them. It's still not too late if you have any questions for our presenters Simply type in your questions in the Q&A box, click Submit. Rob and Ed will get to as many of those as they can at the end of today's session. And then if you see below, you'll see a number of different icons that enable you to do a number of different things. You can email out of this. So if you have some peers in your network that you think would get value out of today's session, by all means, have them join us. You can share this on social media, things of that nature as well. If you want to learn more about the actual webinar platform, we've got an FAQ box. You have an event help guide within that. That should be able to answer any questions you have. If you're having any technical issues, we, we hope you're not, but it, it can happen, you'll see a support chat agent. Make sure that you send those in to the support chat agent and not the Q&A box, and we'll make sure that we can troubleshoot everything as quickly as we possibly can. So today's webinar program, just a brief agenda, a brief overview. We're going to do our welcome and introductions, which I'm doing right now. Uh, we're going to go into Rob's presentation uh, we're going to have a brief poll. want to get some feedback from you guys on on-prem, cloud, or both. We're then going to transfer over to Ed, have a Q&A, and then a brief wrap-up and talk about next steps. As for our speakers, before I hand it over to them, wanted to make an introduction into both of them. Rob Vercher is really an icon in the SAP Sybase community for over two decades, specializing in high-end consulting for SAP Adaptive Server Enterprise and SAP Replication Server with emphasis on performance, tuning, and troubleshooting. He's also written many books on the subject, one of which you'll be receiving after this webinar, and is a leading expert in the Sybase database field. Ed Stangler is also an expert in SAP database products, and will discuss the importance of monitoring the ASC version 16 environment. Uh, at the end of both of their presentations, we'll have a quick Q&A and provide instructions on, on how to do that. If you didn't hear us on the front end, just type in your questions, click submit and then we'll, we'll wrap up at the top of the hour. Just a quick reminder, the webinar is being recorded and will be available for on-demand viewing within the next 24 to 48 hours. So without further ado, I'm now going to turn it over to Rob. Rob, take it away. Thank you, Jason. I'm Rob Bashore of SAP, formerly Sybase, and welcome to this webinar, kindly hosted by Brett Mart. In these crazy times, I hope you and your family are healthy, and I, I wish we can all keep it that way. In the meantime, let's talk about Sybase ASC. I should um, technically say SAP ASC, but, you know, it's been renamed, but I think for friends it's always going to be Sybase. Now, I want to say a few things about sort of recent news coverage before I get into the uh, tips and tricks kind of stuff. 
As we have seen recently, there has been some a fear, uncertainty, and doubt uh, communicated by presumably our competitors about uh, Sybase AZ basically ending life in 2025. I want to say to that one thing, and that is a rubbish, no such thing as end of maintenance, end of life. It's absolutely not the case. Now, admittedly, SAP has not done the best possible job over the past few years to highlight, you know, the Sybase product line and sort of the future of those various products. Fortunately, that has now changed, and I want to spend just a brief few moments looking at what's what's coming up and, and how SAP is currently trying to put the spotlight back on the Sybase product. First of all, there is no end of maintenance or end of life in 2025. The only thing that's going to be uh, end of life or end of maintenance is version 15.7 and 15.x. But that's pretty old by now, and we are moving on to version 16, which is the latest release, right? And that is going to be continued well beyond 2025 without an end date currently in sight or defined, and there is no intention to have an end date for the current release of Cybers products. And that applies to AEZ, IQ, and Replication Server. We will be doing new releases, both for on-premise as well as for a cloud version of AEZ and a cloud version of IQ, which is currently being worked on by engineering. You may want to check out that blog mentioned on the page here, which is by Irfan Khan, ex Sybase, as you may know, and Gerard Kutzmeyer, who is the head of all database engineering at SAP right now. Basically, in that blog, they confirm the commitment to the Cybers product line and the commitment to keep it available and going on, both on-premise as well as in the new cloud version. Now, say a bit more about that. Basically, we're going to get a new on-premise release that is currently planned to be 16.0 SP04 by the end of this year. And when I say AZ, that actually goes hand-in-hand with Replication Server. Uh, they remain technically two different products, but in the context of the, uh, the roadmap and everything, we are really sort of using them together. Um, so both AZ and Replication Server will continue on-premise. There will be, you know, more EBS, called the patch releases, these SPLs, than there have been in the past few years. It will be more regular. And the very important point is that we're going to get a new managed cloud service for AES and application server as well as for IQ. Now, what that means is that um, SAP will be offering a version of AES and IQ in the cloud managed as a managed service managed by SAP, and you can then choose to deploy that, for example, on, you know, the hyperscaler of your choice, like Azure or AWS. That's all not there yet. That's currently being worked on, but that is what we are currently building. So what customers have told us is two things. One, they do not really want to get off ASE because they have these critical financial systems and everything running on there, and they want to keep it that way. But some of them would really like to take it from on-premise into the cloud, still running on AEZ. And those two things is exactly what we are committing to and what we are currently building. Now, if you are looking for documentation about the Sybase products, then, you know, sometimes you may get lost in the maze that is the SAP website. But um, sap.com slash Sybase will get you to all the Sybase products. So that's a really convenient, short URL to remember. On that cloud offering, there will be a lot more news coming out later this year, and there's no fixed release date yet for the, you know, the cloud thing, but you, we are hoping to do something like a beta towards the end of this year. That's going to be things like uh, you know, new ways of migrating your on-premise ASZ server that you have today to an ASZ server in the cloud, and we are trying to make that really easy. There's going to be HADR uh, that you can take into the cloud using Replication Server and, you know, lots of features and, 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 and other things that you would expect from a cloud environment. Can't say much more about it right now, but we are working very hard on that at this moment. The other thing is that ASE 16 itself, be it in the cloud, be it on-premise, we're not standing still there either. We're working on improving and enhancing features based on customer feedback, but also on, you know, core AEZ enhancements, for example, on query processing, you know, optimizer, uh, uh, memory efficiency, and everything. So all the, the things you are used to and you would expect from AEZ, 
but then both on-premise as well as in the cloud. Now, I hope this sort of removes any doubt about whether SAP is committed to ASC and replication server. And I hope this kind of, you know, confirms that we will be continuing this, so there's no need to worry. Okay, with that, let me go into the topic I was asked to present, namely tips, tricks, and the little-known features of ASC 16. And for those of you who have seen me do this kind of talk before, you know, there are lots of the tips, tricks, and little-known features in ASC that, you know, may have escaped your attention, but are probably very useful to know about in So I want to cover a few of those in, um, in the next 15, 20 minutes. So here's the first one. Imagine you are a DBA and you are running business-critical ASC service, and one day somebody, maybe you, you know, accidentally starts the AE, restarts the ASC server, but, you know, with the latest EBF binary in the path rather than your regular binary. Maybe you were preparing for a test or an upgrade, but something went wrong. Your ASC, your production server boots up, but now you have just installed the latest EBF, which you were just hoping to try out. But the next thing you're seeing is that your production ASC server is right now being upgraded to that very latest EBF, which, you know, has not been certified by your IT organization yet, for example. That is not good. And you may need to do something, like get back to your old EBF level that you were running production on. But that means downgrading. Uh, that means probably, you know, uh, restoring if you're unlucky backups and everything. Um, not good, right? Uh, very bad. So one way to avoid this is to be more careful, but, you know, accidents happen. So help is here in the, in the form of a new configuration setting called Prevent Automatic Upgrade. That is available actually since 15.07 SP131, so it's been a little while already, but it also escaped my attention, to be honest. Uh, by default, everything is as it always was, so the scenario above could happen. But if you set this setting to 1, and you boot your AEZ with a different EBF than the previous time, it will refuse to boot, protecting you from this upgrade, inadvertent upgrade scenario. And if you want to upgrade anyway, you need to use the dash dash upgrade OK flag on the data server binary if you want to upgrade it anyway. And this is one of those features. When, when you think about it, it makes me wonder, why didn't we do that? you know, so many years ago, because it seems, you know, really practical and, and useful to know if you're a DBA. I would certainly use it on my production service. Another new feature, um, we've always had the union operator in AEZ, but we never had, until recently, intersect and minus, but we do now. So let's say we have two tables, T1 and T2, with column A and column B, with the values that you see there. You can now run select A from T1, intersect, select B from G2. And what that will get you is a table with the values that occur both in T1.A and T2.B. So in this case, you would get the values 20 and 30. Likewise, we have the minus operator, which will give you all the values from T1 except the ones that are present in T2. So that is the minus operator. And if you want, you can use except as well. Minus and except can be used interchangeably. I believe uh, minus is what is documented, but except is, is just an alias, which is used by other SQL dialects. So I've been missing this for, for a long time, and I'm really glad this is now there. If you are familiar with other SQL dialects, you may have seen that some of them support something like intersect all or minus all. That's really a syntax thing. There's not so much a semantics aspect to it, but I just want to say that the all keyword is not supported in ASC with intersect or minus or except. So when you have SPO3, 16.0 SPO3, you can do this now. Another uh, interesting little thing is the nesting limit for built-in functions. So historically, you couldn't do more than 10 nested levels deep. So you see an example here of is null and sign. If you nest these built-in functions deep enough, you will run out of the nesting limit. And historically, that limit was 10. And you get an error like you see there. 10 was not enough. So uh, back in uh, 1507 SP 110, this was increased to 32. This is a hard limit. You cannot configure it. It was just increased to 32. That was better, but not enough, because in 16.0 SP02, that was actually increased further uh, to uh, 256. 
Why? Well, I think we've all seen the queries that get generated by some packages, um, for example, by some SAP applications, but also by analytics packages that can sometimes come up with pretty horrendous queries with, with a lot of nested functions. And to avoid those um, queries blowing up, this limit was increased. Now, there is another nesting level um, in AUC, and it is not related. And I just want to mention it to avoid confusion. When you have stored procedures, you also have this nesting level, and you can actually check on which nesting level we are with at this level. That is a different nesting level. It is configurable, and it applies to stored procedures that you write. The limit on this page is applicable to the built-in functions that are provided in, S in, um, in ASE, right? So that's a different nesting level, and this announcement is really about the built-in functions, not about the stored procedures. Okay, so ASE has always been, um, you know, a little bit less flexible than maybe uh, some other SQL dialects you may have been exposed to. And especially uh, that applies to things like automatic conversion of data types. Um, especially when you're converting from like strings to integers, that is, um, you know, historically a problem. You cannot add up these two numbers because the first number in this, this sum is a string. And uh, historically, ASD would basically throw an error and say, uh, you can't do this. Right, because uh, you cannot, you know, add a var char to an integer. So you have to do convert. You have to convert the string to an integer, and then you can add it. So we've all come to, you know, obey this because there is now a choice. But when you think about it, you know, it's not so convenient. So in SPO3, there's actually uh, a way to make this a little bit easier. Um, uh, there's a new configuration setting called extend implicit conversion, and if you set that to one, then some of these problems go away. Now you can do select one, two, three as a string plus four, five, six, and presto, that actually works, right? So what happens here is that the string is converted to a number because that is sort of the, the hierarchy of the data types, and that conversion will now go automatically, provided the um, you know the value in the string, of course, is a valid number. It's probably useful to switch it on. Uh, it will, uh, you know, it shouldn't break any existing code. Um, now all your existing code was already doing the proper type conversion anyway, but when you are quickly typing a, um, uh, you know, a query uh, or, or coding up some new stuff, you know, it's, it's going to be a little bit quicker and probably, you know, less error prone than before. So you can see some examples here where it will work like variable assignments, the parameter of a built-in function or the parameter of, uh, of a stored procedure call, uh, those things will all convert from a string to a number automatically. So that's great. Um, just want to point out it's not completely painless for everything you can imagine because if you concatenate like uh, the string with a number, then that number is not going to be converted to a string, which is the other way around, automatically. So some of these things remain, but at least I think some of the headaches that we've all been through for all these years is um, alleviated, which can only be a good thing. So just take a look at this SQL statement for a second. What you see here is, um, is a select from um, a column called Michael from MyDB, then a bunch of spaces and a comment, and then uh, myself, and then another comment, dot my table. You know, um, this looks really weird. But the funny thing is, what it really says is, um, I'm selecting from a database MyDB, a user called myself, and a table called my table. But there can be spaces in between, you know, the dots that connect this, because it's really mydb dot myself dot my table. And the funny thing is, this is valid in every SQL dialect I've seen. Um, nobody writes their queries this way. But I came across this in some other SQL dialects, and to my surprise, this works totally fine in ASD as well. I'm not suggesting that this is something that we've all wanted or, you know, that's going to solve a problem for you tomorrow at work, but it's interesting to see, I think I think it's interesting at least, that there's actually this flexibility in the syntax that probably few people have realized there was, and I certainly have not realized it for, shall we say, the first 20 years that I was working with ASE, but this has been there all the time. Because the query 
that is equivalent to is really what we w- would write normally, like my db dot my server dot my table. Um, so if you want to impress your colleagues or give them a quiz question, then you know here could be a, a good example when you're uh, having a drink in a bar on Friday afternoon. Although <laughs> I realize with the current virus crisis, we're probably not doing any Friday afternoon drinks anymore in the bar. But once it's over. Another enhancement that was done in uh, AZ-16 is um, create or replace. Historically, you could only create a procedure, and if you wanted to create it again, you had to drop it first. But now you can do create or replace, which is uh, more ANSI SQL-like, which really makes it a lot easier because, you know, it's, it's, it's more shorthand and it's, uh, it's less statements to, to type, basically. Um, that's great, but there's one downside I want you to be aware of. And the downside could, in fact, break existing scripts. So it is pretty important that you do keep that in mind before you start using create or replace. And this has to do with how create trigger has historically worked. Um, you may have noticed that if you create a trigger uh, historically in ASE, then it doesn't matter whether the trigger already existed. Because this, if it existed, AZ would implicitly drop the trigger first and then recreate the trigger. That has always been this way. So there was no need to explicitly drop the trigger because AZ, you know, already did it for you. And I certainly didn't bother to drop triggers. I just created them anyway because it would always work. Unfortunately, in AZ-16, this no longer is the case because... In AZ-16, with the create or replace support, um, if you try to do create trigger now and the trigger already exists, it will not drop it automatically and you will get an error. So you will have to either do create or replace as supported by AZ-16 or you have to explicitly drop it. You can say drop trigger, but you have to do it explicitly or create or replace. So I'm going to AZ-16. Uh, could, uh, without doing anything else, could break some of your scripts around creation due to this new feature. So that is one thing to keep in mind. Have you ever seen this syntax? This hello world is, you know, not really exciting, but but that's funny, capital N. This is one of those things that has been around in ASE for many years as well. Indeed, is valid in most other SQL dialects that I've seen. What it means is that the string that follows may contain Unicode characters. And I don't think I've ever seen this documented, but it is, uh, at least not in the AZ documentation, but it works. And I checked with the engineer who implemented it, and he confirmed that this has been there for a very, very long time, and indeed not really implemented. In AZ, you can also have the capital N with a double-quoted string. Not sure if it works on Microsoft SQL Server as well, but... Uh, the capital N is something you may you may come across. Now, when may you see this? Usually, when you reverse engineer something in ASE with some third-party tool. Some third-party tools will always prefix a string with this capital N. So if you see this, you know, uh, nothing is wrong. Uh, do relax. And in many cases, you could simply ignore it because... Um, uh, when you look at the string here, hello world, I mean, there is no extended ASCII or Unicode stuff in there anyway. And even if there was, it would be fine. So if you come across this, just so that you know, uh, this is all fine and dandy and no need to be worried. It's always been there. Another interesting functional enhancement in 16.0 SPO3 are global temporary tables. Global temporary tables are uh, things you may know from other SQL dialects and, and like OMSI SQL. The global temporary table is a temporary table uh, from the perspective of the data in the table. Um, the temporary tables we know in, in ASC are um, temporary from the table's existence. Right? A global temporary table is not specific for a session, but is accessible by everyone in principle, by all users. But every user can only see their own rows. The syntax is a create global temporary table with you know, schema and then upon commit, preserve or delete rows. I'll talk about what that, um, what that will do. Now, one word of warning. If you are running SPO2, 16.0 SPO2, you may be able to execute this create global temporary table statement as well. But please don't, because the implementation SPO2 is not complete. 
the implementation SPO2 was only done to address some use cases that the uh, SAP ERP application had, which was only a subset of what you know this feature can do. So it may seem like in SPO2 everything is there, but in reality, not everything works. So this is really only to use if you have SPO3 or later. You won't get an error message, but just take my word for it. So the table itself, unlike the temporary tables we know in ASE with a hash mark in front, is not dropped automatically. This is a permanent table, but the data in there is temporary. Now, depending on that upon commit clause, by default, it is upon commit preserve rows. So if you don't specify that, then uh, this is the behavior you get. And when there is a commit in this session, the session's rows added in that session will be kept. So after the commit, you can still see the rows you inserted in this temporary table for your session only. If, on the other hand, you specify upon commit delete rows, then once you do a commit in your session, any row that you insert in this table in your session, it will be deleted. So depending on the use case you have, uh, one of, or of the two uh, will be useful. Usually it will be preserved rows. When you exit, when you disconnect your session from the server, all your rows will be gone. And the next time you connect, when you look at this table, you see basically for you an empty table, right? So um, that's how it works. Now, here's a little trick that you may find interesting. So let's create a global temporary table and we do upon commit delete rows. I insert a row and then I select from the temporary table to see which rows I have in the table. And you would expect that one row with you know, column value one, two, three. However, you will see zero. Why? Well, the point is you specified upon commit delete row, right? And when you do this insert, by default, the insert commits itself because we did not use begin transaction. And when the commit happens, then we will delete any row we have inserted in a temporary table, which is the row we just inserted itself. So it's a bit of a funny situation where we insert a row and it immediately gets deleted upon commit. So by the time you get to your select star statement, that row is gone, right? So be careful what you specify for upon commit. And typically, as I said, you would expect preserve rows because if you use upon commit preserve rows, you would have seen the row you just inserted. So there's another um, interesting quiz question for your colleagues. A long-standing feature since version 11.5 have been resource limit, and over the, the years, a number of them have been added. And I just want to highlight two things that I think are extremely useful and that many customers have asked for for a very long time and which have now been delivered. First one is actually a resource limit on the number of locks that a session can have. And I think we've all seen the cases where we would have wished we had this, where you see a session uh, you know, accumulating so many locks due to an error in transaction programming or you know, um, incorrect use of hold lock or, uh, or whatever, uh, incorrect query plan, where the session keeps accumulating locks until it runs out of locks and blocks everybody else in the meantime. You can now protect against this by setting a resource limit on the number of locks that a session can have. So you see an example here of um, the new resource limit called lock underscore count, and you can set this to 100. And when you exceed the number of locks, 100, so you get to the 101st lock request, then the transaction will be automatically aborted by the resource governor, thus stopping you from locking up the entire system. Now, another really useful one is the idle time resource limit, and that was new in 16.0 SP03. If your session is idle for longer than, in this case, 10 minutes, 600 seconds, you can basically have your session killed automatically. Very useful. Now, you may remember Dave Wine, who a long time ago wrote a procedure called SP underscore underscore idle reaper, which, among other things, you can download from my website. Basically, you now no longer need that because this can be done through the resource governor. So, really useful indeed. And lastly, there's a useful, useful diagnostic related new feature in ASE. We've always had the at at error log, which tells you where the error log file is located. What is new in 15.7 ESD4 
even though it was never documented, is at at Sybase, which actually tells you the path name of the Sybase root uh, underneath which your Sybase installation or AZ installation is located. Right, so that's actually very useful for like tools, for example, and, and if you want to double check like where is my Sybase directory that I'm currently executing in. Likewise, at, at Sybase underscore KRG, that is the place where those dot KRG files are located. Right, so uh, sometimes when you try to reboot boot your server, but it can't because the dot KRG file is there. This may be useful to, uh, in, especially with tools, to figure out you know where those things are located. The only thing that's not yet there, even though I have requested a long time ago, is at, at interfaces doesn't exist yet. Um, if you really want to know where the interfaces file is located that your session is using, or that the server is using, I should say, you have to do DBCC resource and now look for that, that one line with R interf path, because that is the path where the directory, where your interfaces file or your SQL hidden file is located. So these are some, some ways of getting to file locations related to your Cybers ASE installation. Let me leave it here for now. Uh, I hope you find these tips and tricks useful. I want to hand it back to Jason at this point. Okay, perfect. Thanks for that. Great, great presentation. Very enlightening. We want to get into a, to a poll before we hand things over to Ed so he can go through his piece for Bradmark and, and how they all fold into this. And the poll, the question here, hopefully everybody can see that within the slide deck. This poll is running within your slide deck. Um, the question is, is your organization considering maintaining its ASC database environment on-premise, in the cloud, or both? So this is single choice. Select one, on-prem, cloud, or both. Click Submit, and we'll give everybody some time to do that here momentarily. So we're going to give you about five seconds. Are you considering maintaining your ASC database environment on-prem, in the cloud, or both. Okay, great. So I'm going to deactivate that poll right now, and we are going to hand this back over to Ed. Ed Stangler is going to take it away, talking about Bradmark surveillance. Ed, floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. That was a great presentation for Rob, as usual. I just have two quick comments on his presentation. Uh, one thing, the intersect and the minus operators that he mentioned are really exciting. Uh, they open up new avenues for comparing rows between tables, for example, and probably other great things as well. But on the uh, data type conversions, I'm a little bit more skeptical about that. <laughs> I've seen a lot of things go wrong in other databases, so I'm, but I'm probably more uh, pessimistic in general anyway. So, uh, But those are great, great things that he showed in that, in that presentation. I'll be talking about Brandmark's surveillance, which uh, is a monitoring product, but Really, I'm going to be talking about some of the items in ASC that you can use to do monitoring. I was thinking about starting with the ASC items and then going to show some things in surveillance, but I'm going to go the other way. I'm going to be showing in surveillance and then talking about some of the underlying ASC technologies that are in use on some of these things. Our software is certified 100% coronavirus free, in case that's important to anybody. I can't say that about the speakers here, potentially. I don't know. But uh, definitely the software is something that something you might want to consider. We have a demo site out there if you want to follow along or try it for yourself uh, an hour later. Uh, it's at demo.bradmark.com colon 12.411. And that one is an instance of our software. We're going to, I think we'll be updating it next week with some new software, but right now there's a software out there that shows everything that you'll be seeing here. And it's generally there's some sample activity generated between 1 and 5 p.m. Eastern if you want to take a look at it during that time. Or you can use our flashback capability which allows you to go back in time. Uh, there's a little calendar icon you can see, you can use to go back in time, and we also have a recent history option that lets you see things over time ranges. That particular demo site is hosted on AWS. If you're more interested in hearing more about how that's set up is in AWS in general, running ASC and other products, you'll definitely want to catch our webinar in May with Peter Thalley. Uh, they'll be focusing on AWS, and we'll be discuss he'll be discussing AWS items as well as we'll be talking a little bit about surveillance on AWS and on-premises as well. And the login for that is over there as well. This is the kind of thing you'll see on the demo site. Um, you can see we have several different uh, servers on the left side, different types of things that we're looking at. And we have, in this case, in the middle of the screen, we flash back to a point in time of last week. You can see near the top there, there's a little calendar control and a time on the left side. We flash back to March 12th at about noon. 
We can go backwards and forwards and see, go one minute ahead, one minute behind, those kinds of things. And we're clicking on an item here, an update statement. You can see the actual full text, SQL text. So you can see the SQL text. You can see various things from that point in the past, a week ago or a few days ago or whatever you like with our flashback feature. Uh, investigating issues with surveillance. One of the, some of the questions that we got from people is, you know, how do you use, how do you investigate issues? Like if you have an ASC that's going wonky or there's a query going wrong or something like that, how can you investigate that? And of course, you can do that at the AS with iSQL and other tools, and you can also do that with surveillance. So one of the things that we can do with surveillance, for example, is look at a time range. So here we're looking at a time range um, over a certain period of time. Uh, this is uh, this was done a few years ago, so it's been some time in October of 2018. And you can see we're looking at a particular time range, and we're seeing the SQL that's taking the most time. Uh, we can see things like the elapsed time, the CPU time. Those kinds of things. This is this information is coming from mon, uh, mon process statement. It's coming from mon process statement, mon process SQL text. Those kinds of tables. Taking into account a couple of weird things that go on in ASC. There's things like the clock skew problem, where sometimes you can have a start time that kind of decides to migrate a little bit <laughs> over time on a on a statement. Those kinds of things. There's a lot of different little things that we that we take into account. But basically, this is the items from mon process statement um, being pulled on a regular interval. And then we also store other information like the plans. So you can see. A at the bottom of the screen, there's a button for loading plans for the item that we've selected, and we can actually load multiple plans. So if during, let's say, an hour time range, you want to see if there's a query plan that is, that is mutating between various different sessions, uh, this will show multiple plans on the bottom part, and you can click on each one to see what you would normally see on SP Show Plan, for example, and you can see if there are multiple plans going on, because that could be an issue. Like if you have an issue on one server, but then you load it up on another server and you have a query on that other server, and it's going very quickly, you, may, you can go back to that original server and look at something like this to see if maybe there's a query plan changing on you unexpectedly during that runtime. And we also show, uh, it's not shown on here, but we also show SPIDs that are executing that too. So if you need to correlate that with anything that you're already gathering at, uh, from sys processes or mon process, uh, mon process or something like that, we can also show you that information as well. Um, now we're getting this, we're sampling this information, and that's what you can do also. You can you can sample for mon process statement, but ultimately it'd be great to see something, you know, shorter statements, uh, things that are running a few milliseconds, for example. Now, if you have statement cache turned on, you can already kind of see that there, but a lot of people don't have statement cache turned on. And without that on, you know, there needs to be some other facility because you don't necessarily want to be pulling mon process statement every few milliseconds or something like that. So, you know, other databases like Oracle SQL Server have facilities that can kind of help with implementing that. And we've done something like that for other databases. On ASC, you have mon sys statement, but mon sys statement is a lot of stuff there. Well, we've uh, spent a lot. We've had a lot of experience with monster statement. We've created what we call our recently executed statements, and we've done a lot of experience with that, even on very busy databases. And so, what we found is we have a really efficient system, a good system for collecting that, normalizing it, that kind of thing. And we'll be bringing that to this kind of uh, time slicing, recent history view that we're showing here. We're going to be bringing that so that you'll be able to see a uh, release coming out soon that you'll be able to see those statements, even if they're very short but very frequent statements. You'll be able to see that on this report as well. But currently, this is a sampling method that we're using for this kind of item. Now, if you want to look at it a different way, like if you don't not, sh not sure exactly if there's a problem going on, you can look at it by SQL by hour in uh, using surveillance as well. So here we have uh, three statements that are executing during the middle of the day. This is actually from our demo site. And you, when I click on one of them, I can see the statement, like an update statement or some other select statement going on. And so you can kind of see what's, go what's an issue for this particular server. And of course, we can flash back on the items as well. So again, we can use the up at the top, we can use a calendar control to go back to yesterday, last week, uh, last hour, those kinds of things. You can see the full SQL text uh, for that time period. You can see the entire plan for that, for the, the equivalent of SP show plan. We can also parse that out to make it more Oracle-like if you're familiar with the kind of Oracle format as well. But a lot of people seem to like the SP show plan output. Now, of course, we can go more in-depth with surveillance, and when you're working on a lot of systems, sometimes there's problems that require a little bit more involved investigation. There's three particular areas I'll be talking about right now, which is uh, transaction log, index stats, and spin lock monitoring. On the transaction log, you know, there's a lot of information there in the transaction log. Sometimes it's a little bit tough to get to. Uh, essentially, you know, to get to it, you have to run dbcc log command, and it takes a lot of different parameters. There's a lot of different ways of looking at it. We have a way that can get to it efficiently for what we show, and we'll see that in a minute. But basically, uh, it's great for especially systems where, let's say you have a transaction log fill up, 
and you don't know who did it. And maybe it was a drive-by. Maybe they came through, filled it up, and boom, they're gone. Uh, the transaction log is one way to, t to find out who that was. The index stats, of course, uh, if you if there's you know if you if you need index stats, you know it. And there's things like the index page cluster ratio and other types of ratios to look at per database. And on Spinlock. You know, with 16, there's a lot of spin locks that were removed uh, that needed for partition caches and things like that. But still, uh, spin locks have become more important, especially as the bottlenecks of disk have gone away. Spin locks have become very important in many areas of AC. There's a lot. To, there's a lot in there about that, and we'll see that in just a moment. But on the transaction log, so this is you know basically DVCC log commands. You can look at the with DVCC log. You can take a look at it by SPID. You can take a look at it by different types of th ways of um, different types of transactions. You know, but you, when you when you're looking at information though for a particular session, uh, you know you have to look at there's a begin record, there's an end record. You have to correlate them. There's a lot of things that go on involved with that. Uh, here we're taking. We can see that when we clicked on our tempdb, we can see some of the top items that were in the transaction log. Uh, there involve mostly inserts. Uh, you can see dollar insert as a transaction name, and there's a lot of rec log records that are associated with that. The, generally speaking, the, long, the larger number of log records there are, the more impactful this particular transaction was. You see the start time, the login time, those kinds of things. A couple of create tables are down in there. With another one we clicked on with Cypher System DB, you can see we have some create tables, some drop tables, those kinds of things are available as well done by the SA user. So different types of things. There's a lot of information that can be mined in there. It could be recent stuff. It could be old stuff. In this case, the transaction log looks like it was dumped maybe never. So you can see it was uh, old records from 2018 are still in there. Index stats, of course, you can uh, click on a database here. You can click on another button to load up the index stats. We have things like the data page cluster ratio, the index page cluster ratio. Different types of ratios are available. Information about index stats. Uh, on spin locks, uh, so in 15.7, for example, if you had a partition cache like you see here on the, on the last row in the top part, we have a partition cache. Each item is protected by a spin lock. I think that went away in 16. So there's a little bit less of a need on 16 for that part type of stuff, but there's still other types of spin locks. This is the kind of thing you can monitor with um, uh, some mon there's MDA tables for spin locks, but there are issues with the counters. For example, when they went to 16, the counters were still 32-bit, so they could still be rollovers. And when you're summing up different kinds of spin locks, it's not really trivial to deal with that sometimes, that this particular one rolled over and that kind of thing. So we take that all into account, some other things as well. And you can see here we're showing the contention percent, the, the grass per second, the weights, and then we're showing a histogram. So generally as things go, generally on these kind of graphs you want to see it either to the left or to the right, but when you have kind of a spread out that means that your spin locks are not being uniformly used. And you kind of want it to be uniformly used since it is hash based. Uh, in addition to the more in-depth stuff, we also have essential items that are being monitored by Brentmark Surveillance. Uh, we have monitoring of the uh, items in general, either, whether they're on the cloud or in premises. One of the things uh, we'll talk about um, in our May webcast is about how we can reach out into the on-premises area, even if we're on the cloud and those kinds of things. So we have a, a nice little uh, monitoring thing for everything. Of course, we have the historical metrics that can be yesterday, an hour ago, last week, uh, months ago, depending on how we're doing the reporting. Uh, we have different kinds of reports for compliance, thing, you know, things that track from SQL to bad logins to auditing, those kinds of things. And, of course, we have all those um, unique metric things that we do for ASC and other databases as well. Uh, one of the things that we can do is audit reporting, for example. Now, this right here is an audit report covering um, a range, uh, a little bit of a range. This is coming from the ASC auditing. So in this case, we've turned on ASC auditing. We also have reports that can be done without ASC auditing, we, what we call our operational auditing. But this is what we call compliance auditing. And this information is coming from the sys audits tables. So you know you can set up the sys audits tables to be round robin action, where there can be a couple of them going on, for example. And you can have a procedure that can grab the information and then put it into your own table. There's some issues with you know looking at either one, so there's things things to work out. And then once you do get it, that information, the sys audit tables themselves don't have everything laid out this nicely. For example, the event information is I believe it's a number code. So we're sitting here, we're decoding that and everything, and showing that here to see very easily that you know these are the log it. The, the the login events, for example, you can see we have the login event on the top there with a P2 value, which is the IP address that it came from. That's a lot of stuff that you have to decode from the audit tables to get that information. But we're showing this, and we can grab a whole ton of this audit information, save it for you, generate PDFs, those kinds of things. Uh, but you can get it from sysaudits and from your own store procedure that copies the audits, table, audits tables on demand. 
In addition, we have uh, the time slicing or the recent history information that we saw earlier. You can see the top sequel between certain time ranges per hour of day. Uh, we have flashback. We have web reporting, which is more long-term information. So if you want to look at data, uh, space usage over six months, you can do that with our web reporting. And of course, we have the audit reports that we talked about. We also have a lot of security compliance in the product itself. So if, you ha if you're subject to PCI DSS or something like that, we have really good uh, security items in the product. We have an alerts dashboard if you want to go alerting. We typically, we can put out the product in, uh, it with where you have a central place that you can log into, look at things, stuff like that. And then each of the satellites are where you actually collect data. We have all sorts of you know, various types of reporting as well, uh, alerting reporting that you can have, like entity uptime. Here you can see I have a Postgres uh, database that's not doing too well, but of course my ASC is doing perfectly because that's how it always is. Um, but that's the kind of thing you can generate is by database entity uptime. And you can also take a look at the alerts and how they're doing. You can see red, yellow, green. You can click down and see more stuff. And again, my SQL server is doing terrible, but my ACs are doing great, which is how it always is for everybody. And that's it for me. Thanks a lot, Ed. Really appreciate it. Great presentation along with Rob. Before we get in to the questions, where obviously at the Q&A session we had a lot of questions coming in from the audience. Before we get into that, I wanted to share briefly the results of this poll. As you can see here, the question was, is your organization considering maintaining its ASC database environment on-premise in the cloud or both? 57% said on-prem. 5.7% said cloud, 37.1% said both. Before we get in, just real quick, Rob, Ed, any any thoughts on that from, from your standpoint before we take some of these questions? Yeah, well, I think uh, it just confirms that making AZ available as cloud option is a, is, is exactly in line with market expectations and customer expectations. So I'm, I'm really glad this is now, um, you know, a commitment by SAP to go. Right. Yeah, I think I think that uh, having it and going to the cloud is a fantastic uh, way forward for the AC environment. But there are some people that do have things that have to stay on premises uh, for now, at least. And so there's always the, the need to handle both at the moment. And what would be great is if you know if we get to a point where things are very flexible on that, so you can migrate to both. But the cloud direction is fantastic. Awesome, awesome. All right, well, hey, let's dive into these questions. If we don't get to all your questions, everybody, and there are a lot, we've had a heck of an audience today. Rob, Ed, the team at Bradmark, and the partners who are involved with this can, can absolutely reach out and get the answers to your questions. But, but let's start with this first one. Guys, we got a question. Is it acceptable to set up the initial 30 gigabytes of temp DB and memory with an additional 20 gigabytes on disk? Pretty fast SAN disk. So I'll um, yeah, let me tell you that. that. Yeah, that's absolutely acceptable, and in fact, you know, I think many of us have done this over the years, one way or another. So, yeah, you can certainly do that. Fantastic. Um, we've got another one. This is coming from Shelly. Shelly says, I've argued for a long time that the response time of the database devices, information obtained and calculated from the NDA tables, should not exceed 10 MS. Is that still true? As in 10 milliseconds, I, I guess that means. Yes. Yeah, well, you know, this is one of those topics you can uh, have long arguments about, so preferably over a drink. Uh, I would certainly say that keeping it as low as you can is certainly a good thing. These days, with database devices being sort of state devices more and more, you know, I would, I would expect that to get lower. So more than 10 milliseconds is certainly something you should try to avoid. Uh, let's, let's just put it that way. Okay, we've got another one. Uh, we'll, we'll keep this with you, Rob. Rob, what host would you prefer? I saw AWS templates for Sybase for a HA in the cloud, prem over cloud, also as cold standby. Boy, so you know, I think what the the person is asking here is basically an architectural question about where you implement your your HA. I don't think I have a real quick and easy answer for that. You know, you need to look at your entire setup. And uh, I think you mentioned on cloud, on premise in the cloud. So it sounds like replicating from one to the other. You know, that's an interesting architectural discussion. And I think Peter Foley, who will be on uh, in, in a later webinar, uh, will probably have a few things to say about from AWS perspective. But I think, you know, there's, this is a, a small question with a potentially very large answer that exceeds the time that we have right now. So interesting topic, definitely, but it's, uh, you know, a lot of considerations attached. 
Okay, on to the next one. What is the future, Rob, of SAP ASC now with the SAP Roadmap? Well, that's what I tried to cover in the beginning. The future is great. Uh, there will be a continued support for the on-premise product line with a new release 6 and 0 SPF4 by the end of this year. And there will be ongoing enhancements in, uh, in ASC as well as a cloud version of ASC as a managed service by SAP. So if you go to the roadmap section on the SAP website, you can find the official roadmap. I believe it's being refreshed end of this month, beginning of next month, if I, if I remember correctly. But basically, that is, that is what the roadmap is. So uh, the roadmap never been as good for the past so many years, to be honest. Great. We've got one from McCoon. McCoon wants to know, are there any standard benchmark results comparing the performance difference, Rob, between ASC 15 and ASC 16? Not sure about that. Uh, not sure about published benchmarks. Um, one thing you could look at, but I'm kind of speculating here, is the, um, the benchmark that SAP itself has published for its an SD benchmark. It's an ERP benchmark. And I know there have been benchmark results for 15, and I presume there will be for 16. But from the top of my head, I don't know. It all, it's all going to depend on whether you use like features like MEMScale in 16 and whether you have the hardware that can benefit from that. Because if you do, you can see you know, very interesting enhancements and improvements uh, in, uh, in, in your performance. So I, I think it's very much dependent on where you can utilize those enhancements in 16. Okay. Uh, to Rob, back just sticking with you, are there any plans at the moment for SAP Sybase ASC to be available on public cloud, say AWS RDS, for example, but not on top of AWS EC2? Well, that is, in fact, available today. So today you can provision yourself an AWS instance with ASC, with subscription licensing, which is basically, you know, just your own ASC server in the cloud. But that's not with RDS. RDS is basically a managed service through AWS. Uh, that that is not. It is a, a subscription licensing model uh, where you pay per hour for your ASC instance. That is available today. I mean, it's, in fact, has been available for, I think, at least one or two years already. So that exists. Whether you want to put it on top of EC2, well, I suppose it is on top of EC2. But for the future, how the ASE cloud uh, version exactly is going to look like and what it will, what it will be under the covers, I, I cannot elaborate on that right now. You have to wait until we publish more information about it in the future. So I think the answer to the question is partly, <laughs> partly this way, partly that way, uh, but no RDS as far as I know. Okay. Uh, I'm going to take this one briefly. Just Hank wants to know, and among other people, can we get a copy of the slides and the recording? Absolutely. As I mentioned at the beginning, be on the lookout for this to be on demand within the next 24 to 48 hours. So if you joined us, you can reinforce what you learned, share it with your colleagues. If you missed us, no worries. You'll be able to see what you missed. But we'll get an email out to you shortly. Hank and others who asked that, thanks for that question. Uh, we've got a follow-up. Uh, from McCoond, and then we're, we're going to tackle probably three or four more guys then for the sake of, of time and everybody dealing with their hectic, busy, crazy life right now. We're, we're going to cut it after that. But this question from McCoon, Rob, says, how, ask how complex is the migration path from ASC 15.7 to 16? Are there many changes to stored procedure code? A a any way you can elaborate on that? Uh, it's just a, a pretty regular version of great. Um, uh, it's not really uh, anything other than we've always done. It's it's a matter of, um, you know, upgrading all your databases in the server um, and, of course, reinstalling Cype system proc scripts, et cetera. But other than that, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty standard. So I do not expect any issues there. The question, of course, is are you going to use any of the new options in 16, like MemScale, right? Um, and then you get into the discussion about how to configure that optimally, et cetera. But just the upgrade by itself, I would not anticipate any issues. Okay. Um, like an IQ, will ASC 16 or upcoming versions provide feature, provide a feature, to run select on system stored procedures? Yeah, I think what it means is uh, in the Watcom SQL dialect, basically you can get a procedure that returns a result set, uh, and you can get that by selecting from it. Um, that is specific for Watcom SQL. I don't think we are planning to extend Transact SQL or ASE to do the same thing. Of course, you can create 
uh, what do you call it, table valued user defined functions that do return a result set, but you can't really put that on top of a system store procedure. Okay, a few more. Uh, regarding resource limit, will it be available to also add for CPU utilization? That was from Russ. Uh, no, sorry. <laughs> so that's it? Nothing to elaborate there? Yep. Okay, good. <laughs> Good. Uh, we've got one from from Wayne. What are the big differences in the SDK for SP02 versus SP03? We have older apps like Cognos Data Manager that break on the SP03 SDK. Okay, I'm not aware of that because my answer to uh, that question would be I, I do not expect any issues, but obviously, uh, you know, this customer has experienced some issues. Uh, this is really something you should take up with support. I, I can't really comment beyond that. Okay, no problem. How much overhead, Rob, does ASC, this is from Anil, how much overhead does ASC incur due to surveillance in terms of CPU and memory? And maybe maybe uh, Ed can chime in there as well. Yeah, I'll take this. I got it. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, we try to keep it uh, uh, under 5% for at the CPU level, uh, for in terms of CPU at the OS as well as the ASC level. And then in terms of memory, it's pretty minimal memory. I'm not sure if they mean uh, disk as well, TIPDB and stuff like that, but in terms of memory, it's pretty reasonable as well. So it's it's pretty low overhead for that item, as well as it's configurable. So you can turn things on and off. And if something does become an issue, you can always turn that off or limit what you're doing. Uh, we have a lot of different controls for that. Okay. This might be for you as well, Ed. Ed this might be for you. It might be for Rob. You, you guys are the experts. But it's from Vinod. Vinod wants to know, does your product have any options for replication tuning suggestion? On our surveillance side, sorry, the, on the surveillance side, there's no replication tuning suggestions. There's just a lot of information about replication stuff. We didn't really cover that today here, the replication side, but, but there is a lot of information about things like the throughput going on and replication path and things like that, that that allow you to really see a lot of information on that. But there's not actually any suggestions currently. We do have alerts, though, some alerts that tell you when certain bad scenarios are occurring, and like uh, and sometimes they'll recommend something, but not a whole lot of repli uh, recommendations. Now, let me just uh, let me let me just chime in here and say that of course sure. replication server has all these replication server counters that provide a lot of low level detail about exactly what goes on inside the replication processes. And <laughs> this is a plug for Bradmark, but honestly, um, uh, I have not seen a, a monitoring product uh, that visualizes all that information so well uh, and pulls together various elements of uh, you know the inner workings of replication at the moment as surveillance. So. Suggestions may be no, but there's a lot of information being visualized for you in surveillance that will be very, very useful for tuning your application. Okay. Is it possible for surveillance, is it possible that surveillance gets the redo or undo SQL from a transaction log file? Ed, would, would that be more for you? Yeah, I, I, I wish the transaction log stored the SQL statements. In replication, you can do something like that, I think. But uh, but in terms of the transaction log on ASC, no, they don't they don't store the SQL, so it's not possible to directly get the exact SQL. Um, you can certainly get a lot of hints, like as we saw on the screen, uh, some of the screens, you can see things like there's a create table going on, and things, like, and you know, obviously the, you can figure out the undos for those as well. But there's no the exact SQL is not there, but you can infer a lot of items about what was going on based on the transaction name. Okay. Jiten wants to know, is there any ASC performance issue in working on ZFS rather than SAN devices? Not specifically for ASC. I mean, um, you know, you get into the entire uh, discussion about, you know, which type of file system, which type of storage is, is most optimal on how to configure it, and that would be true for any database, and it's, it's no less true for ASC. But as such, uh, I don't think there's any issue with it. Okay. We will take one more, and then we're going to wrap it up. We're already over, but so many questions keep coming in, which tells us it's, it's a pretty darn timely topic. This is from Sunil, and I'm assuming, Rob, this is for you. Any documentation about architecture slash features available for ASC Cloud? Not yet, um, but uh, that will certainly come. I, I expect, um, you know, later this year, a beta for the ASC Cloud version, and that will definitely come with collateral and with, um, you know, architectural examples and, and, and all the stuff you would expect. So please stay tuned for that. Okay, great. And I think a lot of these questions, Rob, Ed, you would agree, we have two more webinars coming up. Some of these questions will be applicable for, for Part 2 and Part 3. So uh, we are going to wrap it up on, on the Q&A side of things. I did want to let... Everybody know, we have a very sizable audience today. Uh, 
uh, couldn't be much better. Everybody in attendance, Rob, is going to get a free copy of your latest edition of ASE Quick Reference Guide. We're limiting one book per person within their organization. SAP employees and solution partners are excluded, unfortunately. So look for a post email for delivery instructions. We'll get that out along with the post-event recording and the on-demand version, all that good stuff. Got a lot of questions about the slides and the recordings, so be on the lookout for that. Mark your calendar. Part two of this is April 22nd, 2 p.m. Eastern, 1 Central. Uh, it's going to be SAP ASC IQ and Replication Server Roadmap. Had some questions around that today. It's featuring Chris Baker at SAP. And then part three is Tuesday, May 19th, exactly four weeks, uh, almost four weeks. No, it is four weeks out from then, from part two. At 2 Eastern as well, being consistent in the time. AWS is foundational technologies for running ASC workloads in the cloud. That will feature Peter Thawley at AWS. Rob, you mentioned Peter in one of your earlier answers. We want to we want to end by thanking everybody. Um, we really appreciate your attendance. We know that this isn't an easy time for the world in general. It's it's uh, pretty turbulent times, crazy times. I've never seen anything like it before. I think in terms of educating yourselves and, and delivering content, this is the perfect mechanism to do that since in person is is out the window. So we really appreciate. Uh, everybody attending, we want to thank SAP. We want to thank uh, ISUG Tech as well, partners of Bradmark uh, for participating. Uh, Ed, our, our own here at Bradmark, fantastic job. Rob, really appreciate you taking time out of your day to educate the community uh, for over an hour. I, I'm sure they got a lot of value out of it, and I, I hope we can do it again soon. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of the week.